right. Hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, just after lunch. How are you guys doing? Ni hao. Uh, so I'm from Singapore, so I speak a little bit of Chinese, but not very much Chinese. Okay, so um, thanks. Very nice to be here. And, uh, you know, uh, and so today I'm going to be sharing with you basically, um, you know, about, uh, you know, some of the work that we're doing with GraalVM um, from the research uh, labs, uh, which is based out of uh, the U.S. and also Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to keep the session interactive. So even if you have any questions, uh, feel free to pause. Uh, I'll ask some questions uh, maybe at the end, and then I've got some nice stickers to give uh, for Graal VM. So um, even if you, you know, answer it, I'll share with some of these uh, as well. So I didn't get some of the T-shirts, but next time maybe I get some shirts also. We have some nice color shirts uh, and, uh, and so forth. Okay, so um, how can you run programs faster and what uh, Graal VM is all about? So this is uh, just a safe harbor statement. So a lot of it, sometimes we're looking at uh, Nick's uh, forward-looking statements and so forth, so just something to take note. Um, today, what we are seeing is that uh, a lot of the workloads, people are looking at abstraction, so, you know, managing it at a higher level, right? Uh, we had a lot of discussions on scaling up and scaling out, right? So basically, sorry, scaling down and scaling out, right? People want to be able to save money and things like that. So we see in the past, everything was more about infrastructure, and moving to things like, you know, just platform and so forth. But now everybody wants to sort of move to this, uh, this nirvana of functions and so forth, right? So you're able to then run application virtualization from your code and things like that. You have a lot of resource uh, unit-based uh, scaling functions, capabilities, and so forth. As we go through this monolith journey of, uh, you know, from uh, what we call, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, basically discussions on uh, people are still on monolith architecture. They want to move into microservices, they want to move to containers, and then run on serverless architecture and so forth. Uh, we see that sometimes there's a lot of challenges. Uh, a lot of challenges because the JVMs have become bigger and heavier, right? The JVMs are, are not able to handle third-party languages. Uh, the memory consumption is becoming higher. Security concerns, bugs, and things like that. So how can we look at uh, being able to look at a universal sort of runtime, right? A universal um, uh, you know, compiler that can run all these new services and also can run some of your legacy services and things like that. So these are some of the um, uh, areas that we see. Um, at the same time, when we look at servers and abstractions or workloads, we're also seeing that languages, as people are developing, they're developing higher order in terms of more uh, you know, functional type languages and so forth, so a lot of abstraction. So as we are looking into things like banks and so forth, people are moving from you know, using things like Scala and also then Kotlin and so forth. So these are higher, uh, more abstractions and so forth. So people mostly are looking at, you know, some four or five different journeys, whether they are developers or you're looking at uh, impro improving automation and so forth. You're looking at either rehosting your application, you're looking at refactoring the application. And, you know, maybe some of your projects are based on this, right? And as part of a development framework, you have your pipeline, and then you optimize your pipeline, your whole CI CD pipeline to match these project requirements that you have, right? And so some could be rebuilding and re-architecting your application, right? You want to completely embrace a new type of uh, you know, paradigm and so forth. And, and at the, the, the fifth or sixth journey, you might be reimagining the whole uh, capability, right? You want to program for the edge computing, 5G sort of network and all that, very lightweight um, sensors and things like that. So all these are different types of plans that typically you have. So why do I share that, right, at the beginning? Because those are usually our requirements, where we start from. And then as developers in the development community, we want to try to, um, you know, get our, our, our capabilities and also our requirements aligned to those requirements, and then we can move from there. Um, we also realize that the, we need to know what is the motivation, right, behind the, the challenge of having multiple runtimes. There are many hurdles. So we're processing many frameworks. Um, today, we have teams that are distributed. So, for example, you have a team based in Taiwan doing development, and that might be doing development of different types of languages uh, in the JVM uh, and clusters and things like that. You could have another team based in Singapore, they're doing more like data mining and things like that. So, they are working on different types of libraries. So, you could have machine learning libraries uh, and things like that, but they are not on supported platforms, right? And they're not tuned properly. So, it could be like, you know, you're running Spark uh, libraries on Python, so it could be you know, scikit-learn, NumPy, and so forth. Actually, just a show of hand before I was, was going in, how many people have actually 
used for downloaded Graal VM uh, before. How many people heard of it before I even mentioned it? Okay. So out of all the people who heard of it, uh, how many people have actually gone to the website or tested and downloaded it and so forth? Okay, great. So you got uh, two, okay, three, or almost two and a half. So yeah, it's getting there, right? So it's inter interesting. Um, so what we are seeing is uh, there's a lot of activity now on the website and so forth. We actually, on the GraalVM side, we are reaching almost like 10,000 stars on GitHub. So it's, it's a huge following, uh, very active on, on, on Twitter and you will, you will see why. Um, and at the same time, um, we, we start seeing a support for a lot of different types of frameworks and things like that. Uh, other things that we see in running multiple VMs is that uh, this very costly as we talked about it, right? Uh, they're becoming heavier. Uh, the machines, are, you know, application servers that are running a lot of these virtual machines becoming heavier and so forth. They're cumbersome, difficult to maintain. And also a lot of times, a lot of bugs are added in. And once the bugs are added in, it becomes like a dependency. Dependencies are very difficult to, to measure over time, right? They affect your performance and stuff. Then also there's process communication, meaning like um, every time you cross the boundary of languages from Java to JavaScript, or you're writing Ruby, or you're moving from Ruby to Scala, for example, you're refactoring code, or maybe you're doing some statistical uh, programming using R, you realize that sometimes it's not supported on this JVM, and then you need to run it separately. Then you need to run some Spark, and then again, you need to run it separately again. So these are all very distributed platforms, different VMs, hard to maintain, right? And you, know, you don't really have roles of like, say, I'm a JVM administrator, for example. It becomes very difficult to do that, right? So you want a lot more automation there, and you want a lot more performance built into those kind of core platforms and capabilities. So from the motivation, we realize that the key things that we need to look at are the five dimensions of optimization, right? So um, we usually think about throughput, and also reduce max latency as some of the primary concerns when we want to be able to just switch to a modern compiler just in time and so forth, right? So with that, you're able to then look at things like your ops per second, you know, how fast it is, you know, your time to interact with the certain services as they come up. So from a GraalVM standpoint, we support the just-in-time compilation mode, meaning that um, in the traditional sense, when you look at those JVMs in your existing compiler, that's kind of using uh, what we call uh, you know, slightly, you know, um, early, uh, you know, compilers like C1, C2, and so forth. So with this, you have a modern compiler. So it's a lot more optimizations built in um, and a lot of um, capabilities where you can just switch and point to this modern technique uh, from your IDEs, from your command line, and so forth, and you can immediately get the benefit of this and so forth. So you will see some customers that are already using and getting the benefits of peak throughput, um, you know, reduce max latency, also garbage collection times and things like that as well. So in fact, our own cloud infrastructure, we are using that. Um, and then on the other side of it, uh, basically is the ahead of time compilation. So here where you can burn everything into the executable so that, you know, it doesn't have any dependency on any, you know, JVM, JDK, OpenJDK that you need to run on an external system. So this is what you call if you read about it, it's kind of our part of our Substrate VM uh, capability and so forth. We call it our native executables. So here, you benefit from the three main things. So startup speed, super fast, right? You get like milliseconds, basically. Very important when you have you know, multiple services that are being launched. And uh, you know, uh, depending on, you, you also make a, uh, like a trade-off decision, whether you are, you, your applications are short and you know, fast running and so forth, or complex and long running tasks and so forth. So you can then decide and say, I want to use AOT for some, and I can use JIT for others and so forth, right? So depending on the type of workloads. Lower memory footprint. This is the most important one, because in the cloud, we are paying mostly for a lot of memory, right? So if we can reduce that memory footprint and the boot up uh, sequence for a lot of these applications, that makes things a lot better. And it's not only just software, it's all software running together with the hardware. And then smaller packaging, where you start seeing things like um, not just uh, the packaging of the apps, but also the containers. Right? The containers are also becoming heavier and things like that, you know, Docker manageability and so forth. So five dimensions of optimization, very important. Again, uh, look at the trade-offs between the types of workloads, and then you can use both accordingly and so forth, right? So um, uh, that's, that's an important piece. Um, a very high level uh, architecture on Graal VM, right? So Graal VM is basically uh, supporting the JVM, uh, you know, family of languages. So you have support for your Scala, Kotlin, Gro uh, Groovy, Java, and so forth. And at the same time, we also have interpreters 
which are built into the Graal VM. So when you unpackage, you unarchive the uh, Graal VM, all the, um, you know, the language execution interpreters are already built in. So you can run, you know, basically Python from, from the command line. You can run um, your Node.js runtime and so forth included. Um, oftentimes we get asked questions like, uh, do we support the latest standard for Node.js or ECMA and so forth? So we support the, the latest, uh, you know, 2019, um, uh, you know, draft, I believe uh, ECMA is still in the, in the draft stages, even the, the latest versions of 2019, so we support those latest versions. We download and scan a lot of these libraries and uh, we are able to test and validate that they're actually running on Graal VM. So it's not just a point integration that we actually continuously work with a lot of these uh, interpreters and so forth. And we also support C, C++ uh, with our, we have our LLVM tool chain. So LLVM toolchain comes together with the Graal VM, uh, shippable uh, and so forth, in the, whether it's in the cloud or you download it and, and you run it. So with that, you can actually uh, you know, generate uh, C++ and compile C++ code and uh, also things like uh, Rust and, and third party languages and so forth. So a whole set of languages. And then once you're in, within Graal VM as well, you also have this Truffle, which is language implementation layer. So you can then uh, introduce different types of languages. So because you already have all this abstract, the syntax trees kind of built in, so it's easier for you to model your own language. So if you want to model like a new language that's JavaScript-like, you can use that built-in uh, capabilities and then model your syntax accordingly and so forth. So the more abstractions you have, as you will see, things like in Java, your collectors, you know, your, uh, your streams and all these kind of things, more, more of that, it, more Graal will be suited to have, make it more efficient for you to run and so forth as well. So then in terms of embeddings, you can embed um, a Graal VM and you can run Graal VM rather in the context of OpenJDK. Uh, you can also uh, then run it uh, in Node.js, uh, Oracle database. Uh, so say, for example, you want to be able to package a validation library. You want to run it inside the database, whether it's a Oracle database or even MySQL. As you see outside, for example, you don't want to go through the network and you want to run uh, it in a core database for some reasons, maybe security or performance, you know, you have to pay for network uh, throughput, you can run it there. So we have an, in, we have an integration, uh, what we call a multi, um, uh, multilingual uh, runtime uh, integration uh, with the databases and all that as well. So similarly, you can also think about integrating this with things like Nginx and uh, other types of servers and, and so forth as well, right? And of course, the most important piece is the native executable. So you can generate standalone native executables uh, and they can run, you know, basically autonomously on any system. Uh, as, you know, obviously where it, there's an OS and things like that and there's no dependency on any, you know, JDK that you need to have running on that system. And you will see a short example of that also uh, later. So that's uh, our uh, Graal VM architecture, right? I mean, we have some deeper architectures, a lot of videos uh, that to, to show that. Now, uh, to basically summarize, uh, you know, say for example, in a few slides before we go into the demo, so Graal VM kind of runs in three different modes, right? So you've got the JVM, which is a modern JVM, right? So it's a C3 compiler, so a lot more optimization is speculative, um, speculatives uh, that are included in there. There's also things like priority inlining of, uh, of uh, capabilities, uh, polymorphic inlining, also uh, partial escape analysis. C2 already has some escape analysis, partial escape analysis, so it's an example of how code is run and uh, you know you can see how that uh, partial escape analysis using uh, control flow aware techniques to postpone the allocation to the branches as they are, when they are needed right so actually shows you the before and after effect other things we do uh, where things are like uh, auto vectorization and also path duplication guided optimization where we can learn from the previous run of the application uh, where we can understand the previous configuration files uh, that are needed. For example, when you're creating native images and stuff like that, and many, many more. So it's like 60 plus, so close to like 80, 100 optimizations that we see. And there's obviously there are two other modes that Graal VM runs in, which is the native mode. As I mentioned, there's the, the just-in-time mode. That's the ahead of time mode. And then the third capability is the polyglot. So you can mix and match different types of languages. Uh, for example, you'll see the polyglot.js example uh, that we're going to be showing you. So you've got Express, Java, and also R, uh, you know, running all together three different languages in, uh, in basically one polyglot.js. 
So that's a, it's a pretty interesting way, right? Uh, and so our secret sauce, our, our, our modes of operation, and uh, you know, some of the differences on how uh, we actually see the, um, the coding that's done. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you a live uh, demo anyways, but you know, the key thing is that if you look at before and after, it's almost sometimes so difficult to show a demo in GraalVM because it's so fast, right? When you start it, it already finished, right? So it's like four milliseconds and things like that. So, um, you know, just to give you an idea uh, where we are running some of these. So we go through some of the, the one of the best ways for GraalVM as you are experimenting is to go through what we call the top 10 things, right? Once you understand the architecture, you understand the modes of operation, the key thing is to start thinking about the types of workloads you have uh, and how you can use those workloads with GraalVM. So um, what everything here is kind of built in into the, uh, there's some demo sequences, demo labs, you know, if you have your own uh, labs and so forth. So you just search for basically, um, let, me, let me have a get bigger. So uh, you can actually uh, basically just Google and, and find these top 10 things and so forth. You'll be able to see it and I'll show it later. So all these packages typically are already installed for you. So you don't have to run all this native image installation, uh, Ruby, Python R is already kind of in there, right? Um, and so forth. So what you do essentially is once you, have, um, once you are into the system, you can uh, just do a Java version and you will see that uh, you're already running on GraalVM. So basically on the bottom line, you'll see that GraalVM EE is already running today. The latest version is 19.2. So I have 19.1.1. .1 .1. And um, instead of your regular hotspot or CE, uh, what I've got is I'm running GraalVM. All I did was just basically I ran like an export path command, right? So it is basically just a, a um, command like this. That's it. So that's the only command I really need to run to point the path to GraalVM. After that, all the execution is based on that and so forth, right? So that's a very, very easy, easy uh, thing to do. So one of the first things we want to do is basically... Um, this whole concept of one VM to rule them all, right? So one compiler to run almost any different types of language and syntax and so forth. So we've got a, um, you know, top 10 uh, basically uh, program. So it uses a lot of uh, sort of abstraction. Uh, I mean, newer features like collectors and streams and so forth. So you've got this here. And what we're gonna do is we have, we'll compile the program, which we've already done it. And uh, we're gonna run uh, a, uh, with a large uh, text file. It's almost like 150 MB in here and so forth. And once we run it, uh, what we're going to see is that um, over here, we just time it, right? We time that uh, run of that particular um, um, compiled uh, code. We will see uh, how long it takes. So this is running it with the default, which is what we have changed it to, GraalVM Enterprise Edition. So you will see how much time it takes, right? You can see the user uh, clock, the real uh, sys clock, and things like that. It should show my machine right now, maybe in the order of about 14 seconds or so forth, right? In terms of the, um, uh, but this is when you're looking at the just-in-time component. So you're looking at the uh, throughput and also your uh, peak performance capabilities and so forth. Next, we will run it on that same node, uh, the similar way. What we do is we run that as a sequence to disable the uh, GraalVM compiler and run it accordingly. So once we do that, we realize that, that there's a big time difference between the two. Uh, this should take, you know, in the order of maybe 30, 40% more. So it'll take about 20. So what I said here was, I said, uh, you know, it's almost like a minus or so use the regular, uh, gra the regular compiler without GraalVM. So here, what it means is that because GraalVM is built on top of hotspot and we connect it through the JVM CI layer, what we call the compiler interface layer. So here you can see it took almost, I uh, can't really see it there, almost like 20 seconds, right? So, I mean, um, and, and so forth. So that's almost, how much is that? Like 30, 40% difference. And that's just a single or other, not even a dual core machine that I'm running this on, not even having power connected. So that's one example, right? That's so you clearly see the uh, just-in-time capability. So who is kind of using it this way? So you've got Twitter in production, we'll talk about it. Um, and uh, similarly, we can also run things like Scala in production and so forth. The second one uh, basically is uh, the, uh, if you want to do your low footprint fast uh, startup. So this is the ahead of time. Earlier, the example you saw was the just in time. So when I run ahead of time, uh, we run the same thing. So basically we do like um, a make small text uh, from there. And uh, we can just go through that sequence. We'll see that that's already up, up to date. And uh, let's run the, um, 
um, small text with that. So basically what we see is that from here, some of the applications sometimes, you know, you're looking at smaller input. So it takes a um, long time, a lot of memory, say for example, or 70 MB or so forth and, uh, and things like that. So sometimes with the Java platform, it's strong for long running applications and stuff like that, but short running processes can suffer from it. So how do you, you know, uh, use your ahead of time capability to pre-compile and burn everything to the binary and so forth. So let's run that. And basically we see how much time that takes. So that takes about, okay, uh, like 0.21 in terms of those uh, real system time clock and so forth. From there, what we do is we have uh, GraalVM as a native image generation tool, right? So we do that. And if we hit that, um, and we will start seeing that it actually basically starts creating the native image. Now, you might ask me that the native image is taking some time to create. Okay, but uh, you're not going to be doing this all the time. You're going to create the image ahead of time, maybe through your CI CD process and stuff. In the future, we'll have some kind of cloud service and whatnot. But even so, we're creating the native, native, native image, so it goes through a lot of iterations and cycles, a lot of class lists and so forth. So we're looking at all the uh, different link, uh, link lists and, and whatnot, and we're burning everything into, the, into that um, uh, self-native executable that you will be able to run by itself. So it's already done. And then um, we've seen quite a bit of that capability. So it generates you know, that native executable called top 10, right? So what we did is we used the Graal VM ahead of time compilation capability to do that. So uh, it compiles and pre-compiles all that capability, right? So we also call it substrate VM and so forth. It's also written in Java, right? So that uh, and so forth. So now let's just do, uh, you know, and see what is the, the size of it and things like that as well, right? So we can see some of the dilibs and the paths and stuff like that. We can see the current version and, uh, you know, details accordingly um, and you can track it from there. Um, in terms of the size, it's obviously been shrinked down, so you can, you know, it's probably like uh, 7 MB and things like that. So you can see it's like 6.7 uh, megabytes and so forth. So you, uh, not only that, you get smaller packaging uh, and benefits of AOT and so forth, right? So now when we run it, we will see that the order of magnitude is much faster. So we run that same, um, you know, top 10 with a small text input. Uh, we will see that the startup time should be, you know, 0 0.02. That's almost like you know, near real time, right? Compared to 0.21 and so forth. So that's um, a simple sort of uh, demo on that short running JVM demo for JVM. Similarly, we have demos like that for Scala, uh, Scala native uh, and so forth, which is being used and so forth, whatnot. The third one, uh, basically, and the, 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 probably the, the one of the ones that I'll basically show here is uh, the, um, um, your polyglot capability. So, you have multiple programs. So essentially here, uh, what we see is that um, as we go through, I think I got carried away with the demo stuff. So you, let me go back uh, to the presentation. So what you saw earlier was on the just-in-time and the ahead-of-time capability, right? And, um, and performance and so forth. So now let me relate back to the real world, right? The real world is that you know you, you, you have to basically map it to real journey. So you've got rehosting, so you've got heavy application service. So how many people here are working with Tomcat, um, WebLogic, or maybe another application server like IIS and stuff like that? How many people? I'm sure everybody is working in some kind of application server, right? And as you know, biggest problem is they are monolith in a sense. They're heavy, right? They're beefy and all, again, the JVM and all the clustering and maintenance and stuff. So a lot of legacy apps, and then your requirements coming in, you have to integrate with a lot of different uh, CI CD tool chain to modernize and whatnot. So, um, aside from just looking at an application server or third party, you want to be able to make it a lot faster for your data center so you reduce the operating cost. So in the future, maybe uh, you want to be able to have more hybrid capability where you have a centralized compiler and runtime that you can add into your application server roadmap and architecture. So this way, you can maintain legacy and then also future-looking applications. You can reduce the cost of operations and stuff like that. Another one um, where we've seen in terms of, uh, you know, what we call rehosting or move and improve, lift and shift, or whatever requirements like that is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. So Oracle has its own cloud infrastructure. How many people know that we have a cloud infrastructure in Oracle? Okay, that's great. That's uh, it's good to know. So we actually have quite, quite a bit. There's uh, a lot of data centers around the world, right? And uh, they've been built. So uh, one of the telemetry surveys that was being used 
uh, in the cloud infrastructure, what they did was they point and reference and they switched it basically. Uh, it was just a you know, point and click change basically from uh, the hotspot uh, Java 8 to uh, Graal VM. And they were immediately getting a lot of benefits that you saw in terms of, um, you know, it's a drop-in replacement and so forth. You start seeing throughput, uh, which is as predicted, uh, just in time, right? We get a throughput and we also get a lot of the performance. So 10 million hours uh, of core uh, service running and uh, with very little issues. Now, that's, that's pretty good, right? Uh, so, and uh, as you know, telemetry, if you guys have used a lot of cloud providers infrastructure, that is a very you know, um, intensive sort of service because there's a lot of telemetry that is needed and, uh, and things like that. A lot of uh, metadata you know, uh, store changes and whatnot. In the future, we are looking at native image for API um, and checking the developer tools and so forth. Second, you might be looking at maybe refactoring your application. Old application, you need to write wrappers, you need to embrace uh, service broker API, whatnot. Uh, you need to embrace Scala. Scala is new uh, to this part of the world. Uh, There's a lot of good activity and whatnot. And so you want to be able to use maybe your existing, uh, you know, your JVM, your compiler, which is optimized and run Scala. And you want to run polyglot capabilities. So here, what happens is you want to also look at cloud native uh, and at the same time gain the ability to react, uh, time to uh, react. So this is the third kind of demo, basically, that we have. So this is a polyglot. So you actually have a polyglot.js, and uh, it's a Node.js uh, program, as you see from my express standpoint. Uh, there's also a Java beginning here, uh, floating point output, and uh, that you will see after this is executed uh, in terms in the context. And then also there's an R plot that we see from a polyglot uh, capability. So that's what it looks like. So if we go back to the demo to see how we generate this, uh, how do we run this in the context of Node and so forth, uh, we have... Um, that um, you know that code segment that we saw earlier. There's a polyglot JS. So basically, that's what it is here. So when we want to run it, we basically run this uh, what we call node uh, dash JVM uh, with the flag and polyglot .js on that um, command line over here. And uh, once you run that, it'll take uh, you know probably uh, less than a couple of seconds, and you will see that it will you know paint or project that uh, it will be listening on port three thousand. And you'll see the lattice, uh, basically, that is um, uh, output. So that will just be localhost. And uh, that usually takes about a second or two. And uh, let's see that um, same projection of that lattice, which is all the output of uh, the graph and so forth. We can actually monitor it from within the um, uh, there. So it's loading the required package and so forth. And we will see that uh, output over there. So that's the Java. Uh, floating point, and then at the same time, the um, express and also the R uh, plot, right? Uh, you see the cosine, sine curves, and, and things like that. So this is pretty interesting, right? Because you are able to now um, essentially uh, code in a different style. Uh, you can actually do polyglot programming. So they, you are not, you're not penalized by going from one boundary to another and things like that, right? So any framework, any language, and so forth. So it's like a host guest sort of relationship. If you think about how VirtualBox was, you can have host and guest third party. So similarly, you can do that. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. R and Spark. Yeah. So there's a, um, uh, for example, you can do it with mixed different types of languages. So you can actually the host guest relationship uh, can be different. So here we do in the context of so Java calling third party. Uh, we also seen some people doing from R. Okay, they want to have uh, you know like a Spark um, sort of Scala uh, combination and so forth. All you do is you just declare the polyglot. There's a source. There's a context, and then from there you are able to start running all these uh, different uh, capabilities as you will, uh, which is great, right? Uh, and this is what we need, right, across the enterprise. So we talk about the geographical distribution. You're doing data mining in country B, uh, specializing in certain development here. Now you can collaborate, uh, not only just an integrated development environment, but also in a platform where it's in, in real time without any um, performance penalty. So, um, yeah, so then, um, yeah, good question. So, you know, you get a, obviously a nice sticker for that and so forth, right? So, yeah, so that I'll come and give it to you. Yeah. So you also get a sticker. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 
you've got the node uh, capability within here, so you can run node, a node, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, we actually pre installed that together with Graal VM. So, what we happens is we actually have a, a capability where we have matched it in performance to V8 uh, and so forth. So, we, there, there's been a separate talk on Node.js and our capabilities recently. I'll be more than happy to share that with you. Uh, not only that, we support all that later CCMA standards and whatnot. So all that capabilities as you unpack is all kind of in there. So all that runtime, you'll see even a Python, Node, and third-party ones all in there, baked in, built in for you. So um, it's a great, excellent question there. So then, um, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yes. Spark and Flink. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, compress. Um, so we have some uh, articles that were actually written by third party, uh, you know, folks like, um, you know, partners and things like that. There was one with Spark and R. I recall there were some, some, some areas in Apache Flink and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, stream, stream processing where they were able to reduce, you know, a lot of companies using um, data analytics running on Spark, you know, 10 to 15%, they were able to reduce the streaming. In fact, there's a cus there is a, um, a customer who is using that it's kind of automotive. Uh, so they're able to get a lot of that uh, performance savings uh, with um, running Spark uh, streaming together with uh, a lot of their nodes and clusters are basically based on uh, on Scala and things like that. And then they ran it with Graal VM and they're able to save like 10, 15, 20%. Um, so that, and then the other one, we also have an article that I can share on the Spark or uh, polyglot functions and all that as well. So I'll share that um, in, in there. So great, a lot of questions on Spark, oh no, on the polyglot function. So going back to just the second part, which is the, uh, as you refactor application. So Twitter is one of the largest use case. Uh, they've been running Graal for over a couple of uh, years now. Uh, you know, when you they dispatch the tweets, they're basically going through Graal VM. So you can reduce all those high CPU cycles. So in the, in the words of Chris, who is, uh, you know, the, um, uh, one of the uh, engineers, the uh, staff engineers from Twitter VM team, uh, he basically said, if you're running Scala and if you don't use Graal VM, basically you are just, uh, you know, uh, you're losing out, right? You're not, you should be saving money and you should be doing it. So you're a fool if you don't use Graal VM together with Scala. So it has been tested uh, not only by them, uh, but also we have a Renaissance benchmark uh, that you can go renaissance.dev and you will see a lot of packages tested there like Akka and, um, you know, all the different types of Scala types of packages and that way you can see what were the performance differences and so forth and you can run it for yourself here's a banking reference they were looking at batch processing high cpu usage they were able to reduce to 16 minutes and you can see scala uh, when you compare it to uh, obviously higher is better uh, so the ratings and so forth we actually see you know um, from maximum to average uh, much uh, more efficiency when, it, when you're running it with the uh, graal pm and things like that so almost 38 percent on average difference Another one uh, where uh, one of the companies that evaluated the differences between AOT and just, on, just in time, they used the prime number sequence and they were able to see, uh, you know, again, 30, 40% differences, Disney streaming services, and they actually uh, talked about it. They uh, uh, shared their experience with the Graal VM service and so forth. Uh, third is uh, re-architect and rebuild. So you want to create native images, as you mentioned, build serverless functions. Uh, you want to reduce container. Um, boot, uh, I mean the container size images and you want to support languages in the database, right? So um, we start, we, you have a lot of cold startup issues with, uh, with Lambda-like services today. So you're paying for that cold startup uh, sequence. So you can leverage Graal VM, uh, it's written by a third party again, a partner, uh, to run Java with Go. Uh, we also had an interesting chat on, uh, you know, how are some of the, um, uh, if you're evaluating Go versus Graal VM, what are some of the trade-offs, you know, we start seeing a lot of the uh, throughput capabilities that are better even within Graal VM. And with Graal VM, you know, there's, uh, there's less of rewriting of the application, right? 
Plus, you can leverage on your existing Java applications, JVM stack, and Spark, which is you know, streaming, Scala, and stuff like that, where we know that. So it's a, you've got a familiar sort of base, right? And, uh, and not to mention the, the lower uh, memory. So we have already compared Benchmark against Golang as well. So then uh, we look at smaller base Docker images. Uh, we see those um, native images uh, for Docker using Graal VM, as you see in the stack here with, uh, with Docker, Reactive, um, as well as uh, Spring. And we can put Java apps into containers and so forth. In the future, we're also looking at things like Graal containers, Graal OS, and sort of, sort of um, capabilities. And then um, next, you might be looking at replacing. So you want to do more diagnostics. So Graal VM is not only just three things, but we also have a diagnostics capability that's built in to Graal VM. So you can do things like performance monitoring, tracing, uh, debugging, profiling, and stuff like that. So you can do guided optimization. When you run once, you can learn from the previous behavior. And you can do isolation across boundaries and threads and so forth. So here, we have actually integrated with the Chrome uh, debugger uh, gateway. So you've got uh, Graal VM uh, basically integrating uh, to that. And then you've got the dev tool. So you go through some um, you know, iterations. You can do suspension and execution. And then also at the same time, you can do columns and breakpoints. This is part of the top 10 things. So you can run this. I believe you can run this in Ruby, Python, and the one on the top 10 things. And then uh, also at the same time, you can run it with uh, obviously with Java and things like that. So you can step through and iterate and so forth. So this is again, useful for you know, functions and also other microservices when you want to start debugging and so forth, right? So um, big reference that we see here is uh, um, just like Salesforce, NetSuite is, is large SaaS provider. So they used, uh, they wanted to package third-party risk, uh, third-party libraries and make it available a multi-tenant architecture. So at the, at the same time, they wanted to have a closed wall assumption to some of these, so they didn't want to expose the, or increase the attack surface. So GraalVM platform, you can generate these. Uh, you can leverage the GraalVM security, rather, and you can reduce the risk from uh, third-party attacks. So you can actually, um, you know, and you can combine across uh, different types of languages. So there's going to be more implementation of Python libraries and all that going forward. The fifth thing you can do is the sky's the limit, right? So we start thinking about um, you know, Python, TensorFlow type uh, AI, uh, deep learning uh, infused into self-learning uh, code, uh, self-generating code and stuff like that. So we're starting to see even GPU acceleration um, and also deploying apps cross-platform. That means, for example, you want to deploy Graal VM on iOS, which is uh, you know, your um, Apple uh, and uh, your mobile um, and so forth. So how many people work on mobile technologies here, mobile development, or, or would like to, right? If you had the platform, I'm sure you could reach that. So GraalVM can be, we done that. We done, we've actually done a talk with Scala and then with Java, how we can leverage JavaFX and uh, for the desktop, that's with JDK 11, but then also Scala uh, with Java for the, um, uh, for the uh, iOS uh, mobile uh, capability. So we actually developed a desktop chat app. And then container native uh, extensions like unit kernels in the future as well. So here's a good example of uh, Goldman Sachs. They use the Truffle uh, implementation framework and they brought their own language. So they brought their own language called um, you know, Slang uh, and into Graal VM and uh, it was supported. Uh, they built it and they maintained it. And uh, there's a whole talk on how uh, the, the engineer, uh, the, the lady over there talked about how you can profile and debug across boundaries and uh, you know how their team is and how they're using Truffle, which is our language implementation layer. Um, this is the Spark example, uh, where we had Spark streaming and uh, we had performance. People, they, they were actually looking at, basically looking at uh, um, the, the large data analytics segment and so forth, and it was costing them a lot uh, for Spark uh, analytics. So they wanted to look at a thousand nodes of this and they were scaling across multiple data centers. And they wanted to have a 10, 15% cost reduction. So Spark streaming, again, uh, we ran this with Graal VM over a proof of concept over, uh, I think about uh, a couple of, um, uh, within a, a month or so. And within the POC, we were able to see that uh, kind of thing. Uh, NVIDIA also, uh, which is graphics, we start seeing uh, ability to uh, run interrupt between multiple language. Uh, we had GR CUDA, which is kind of, again, another language polyglot platform uh, powered by Graal VM. We also have um, code plugins for different types of uh, IDEs, uh, you know, and so forth. And we also have uh, JFR, so you can do your flight recorder simulation within Visual VM. So Visual VM now comes packaged with Graal VM. How many people use Visual VM here? 
uh, as part of Java or Java Flight Recorder uh, for diagnostics and stuff. So then you see this, this is going to help even more, you know. So then Ruby and R, of course, it's there, but you know the um, you know more of that uh, like fast R and the Truffle Ruby um, is um, we will start seeing that uh, availabilities uh, coming in. So in essence, you kind of going through quite a bit of these journeys. Um, you know, for serverless applications, uh, how many people are using serverless here? Uh, serverless architecture, uh, for example, like, uh, you know, serverless, is one, okay, yeah, so, so you get smaller footprints, you got multiple opportunity for serverless functions, you know, you can run Docker startup, uh, you know, uh, usually fairly large, um, you can run it across multiple tenants with the heaps and avoid a lot of interference, isolation, and at the same time, you can do a lot of smart caching and whatnot. So here is an example of, uh, for microservices, the ahead of time, which is the native code. When you compare uh, the different types of uh, microservices, uh, today the popular one is Micronaut. Uh, a lot of people are looking, even Spring, uh, you know, to Micronaut. So a Micronaut startup is, uh, you know, in the orders of magnitude 50 times faster than when you compare with the regular hotspot. This is J what are you doing here to com comparing the JIT versus the AOT mode, both within Graal VM? And so you see the differences, right? Um, Halidon is a microservices uh, framework that is coming from, uh, again, it's open source. Um, also, we have a um, uh, standard edition that comes out of uh, Oracle. Uh, so that's microservices. So then also Quarkus. Quarkus uh, comes from Red Hat. And uh, again, that uh, container-based uh, uh, Kubernetes framework microservices is tailored for Graal VM and things like that. And then finally, the memory footprint is also considerably slower and so far, uh, much better. So here's the Red Hat reference where they actually leverage Graal VM. You can actually go to the link and see on there uh, how natively compiled Java code is better. So they actually show you the application response time, the, uh, which is much faster, the container size, and also the startup sequence and so forth, uh, and also the service. So, so imagine yourself as you're embracing these journeys, you're going through JVMs become, uh, you know, it's very good for this heavy beefy sort of journey of, of um, JVMs as you move towards more of these services, they become expensive, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so you need to look at performance characteristics, look at the dimensions of optimization, right? Uh, think about lowering, lowering your memory consumption, think about geographical spread of uh, how do you want fast startup for certain types of apps complex running apps, long running versus short and you know, fast lived. And then um, you know, how you can go down all the way to function and service, but at the same time, uh, ensuring you, know, you get the universal runtime, uh, the consistency, uh, cold startup issues are prevented and so forth. So with Graal VM, you get a lot more of that uh, and you're able to you know, create uh, different types of forks, uh, capabilities across your different languages. So, um, and that's about it. You know, basically, uh, I would say in summary, um, as you're beginning to test, the first thing I would say, go through the top 10 things uh, and start thinking about workloads that you want to test. So it could be something as simple as Java uh, that, you know, is JDK 8 and at the same time, multi-tenant app of uh, if you're launching a multi-tenant app or service and you want to have lower trust levels or trust boundaries, you can do that. Uh, if you're looking at microservices from Monolith um, and you're comparing it against Golang, you see the flexibility, less rewriting of code. Um, you know, uh, throughput and multilingual capabilities. Uh, if you're adopting Scala, and also if you're looking at Nashron and Rhino, there's so, uh, as you know, there's the support was actually removed uh, from Nashron and Rhino with JavaScript on Java. So you have the whole uh, capability now with Graal VM. You can actually use that. Uh, these are some other things like embedding applications and also cloud native uh, Java uh, stack microservices. So that's pretty much you know, what we have today. And I uh, just wanted to kind of share that. And uh, since we have like one or two minutes, I'll just leave it for some um, uh, questions. If not, then I just have maybe one or two questions and uh, you get a sticker if, uh, you know, uh, whatnot, I'll distribute it anyways to you guys. So, um, okay, so I'll just ask one or two questions. Okay, so I talked about, uh, we have like one minute, two minutes? One minute, okay, so two questions, right? So I talked about three different operational modes of Graal VM. Uh, what were, somebody can name me, well, if somebody can name me all three, then you obviously get three stickers, but uh, if you can name me one of them, you know, one person each, uh, then uh, you can basically get, uh, let me know. So Graal VM can run in what different types of modes of operation? You saw the demos just now as well. Okay, yep, all right. 
wow, it's awesome. There you go. It gives all three. Yeah. So sorry about the second, uh, second person right there. That's fast. Okay. So somebody who can name me uh, five of the optimizations that we've got in Graal VM. Okay. Two, just two. <laughs> name me one or two uh, of the optimizations that you, that you saw. You know, talk about that secret sauce and stuff like that. Bit of a tough one there. Um, any guess? Okay, that's the operational mode. So this was more like duplication, partial escape analysis, and stuff like that. So, uh, but anyways, great stuff. Thanks, you've been an amazing crowd. Um, very good questions, and uh, no, thank you for your time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Well, for now, uh, you have uh, the capability of running it as a community edition. So I would encourage you to run uh, as part of the, um, you know, to encourage the adoption and the consumption of these services. I would encourage you to go in and just go to growlvm.org and uh, download and run the community edition. You will see the performance gains already there. So some of those optimizations are also built in, like in that uh, we talk about escape analysis, duplication, and also some of them are already there, like uh, partial escape analysis and whatnot. But of course, more advanced ones for those really complex, long running tasks that are very systematic, uh, you know, uh, heavy intensive applications, uh, maybe those are different, but you can already get the performance gains uh, and with the community edition. Uh, this logo basically is from our community edition and stuff like that, and so you can run it and it's available. So that's the uh, growlvm.org uh, in case you uh, see the uh, website, uh, basically it's uh, for you to I don't, I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, but uh, yeah, it's growlvm.org. So you basically are just able to go in and, uh, and see it uh, from within the, uh, uh, should have it here. Yeah, so basically just this site here. And, uh, and in there, you are able to see, uh, you know, different uh, sort of uh, um, things, you know, what it is and, uh, you know, what are some of the things you can do um, and, you know, downloads and stuff like that, uh, you know, compatibility, uh, with ECMA, Node.js, and all these kind of things are all available there. So community edition is the way to go. And um, you can reach me on Twitter, use Twitter, use GraalVM, same time, and then uh, direct message or send us uh, uh, an email with any way we can actually help you. That's the community edition website. Thanks for that question. Thank you.